it would be really helpful just to get a quick scan of how many people, if you can raise your hand if you know nothing about the Enneagram or you know just a little bit. Okay, wow, that's a, a good amount. So wonderful, we're in the right place. Yes. So, um, could you give just a brief overview of the Enneagram? Just, I know it's hard, it's a big body yeah, of knowledge. Yeah, it's, it's not an easy sound bite. Um, no. <laughs> Well, the Enneagram, mostly if people learn about it, what they learn about first off is that it breaks human character down into nine fundamental components. Yeah. Uh, the idea is that we have all nine of them in us, but one of them is our default setting. It's what we do when the chips are down, and here's where it gets interesting from the point of view of what we're looking at at this conference, is that it's what we do when we're not mindful. It's a study of the automatic patterns that tend to take over our life when we're not present. Now, what's interesting about the way we learn to work with the Enneagram is it's not just about going around putting numbers on people, which is kind of obnoxious, uh, but it's, uh, it becomes a tool for mindfulness because when we notice the patterns that we usually take ourselves to be, what we're uh, identified with some large percentage of our waking life. We have a way of remembering to come back to presence of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. If I find my main habits of inattentiveness, even if those look like productivity or being on top of things, right? Mm -hmm. There's a way that that becomes a reminder, come back, come back, come back to yourself, breathe. Find your body, find your heart, find your inner quiet. And so really, although the kind of popular version of it is like just figuring out which of these nine types, I, I always remind people, you are not a type. You have a type, but you are not a type. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a form that our consciousness takes. And so uh, my point of view is, is that um, this was designed for people interested in being awake. Mm. It was designed out of spiritual tradition as a tool for us to remember our consciousness and the consciousness of the other person. Yes. So for me, that's a, it's also a symbol. I guess I should say that. It's a symbol that goes back to Pythagoras and the Greeks. Uh, but that's another story. <laughs> yes. I have a quote uh, as I was preparing. Um, that I think is relevant. The Enneagram in its original presentation has to do with presence, has to do with really being in and loving the moment, mm -hmm. which is the only moment we have. And it helps us see the capacities we have that support us living in the moment, but it also helps us see what we do instead of living in the moment. Mm -hmm. The Enneagram gives us some answers about why we don't live in the moment. Mm -hmm. So in the Enneagram, can you give an overview of maybe how ways that people don't live in the moment? Sure. Um, well, the other thing that was interesting, and maybe we'll come back to this, is that when we presence the patterns that make us forget ourselves, they're transmuted into gifts that actually help us live our life. It's, it's like our, our greatest gifts have been hijacked into sustaining a, a kind of self-system and as we see that with compassion, and that's a very important part of it, we're neither acquiescing and just saying, oh, that's me, nor are we rejecting it. There, there's this quality behind each of the nine Enneagram types or points that comes forward. So um, some of the ways we do that, the, we break it down in the Enneagram to the idea of body, heart, and mind. Mm -hmm. There are other elements of it, but we are we trade in presence in the body for either a kind of dull resistance, mm -hmm. hell no, I won't flow. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm fine just the way I am and just accept me like I am or, you know, et cetera. And there's a kind of rigidity, stubbornness, um, set in our ways, habitual, right? And, or the other version of that is what I call the decapitated chicken where we're running around doing all kinds of things. We might even be doing yoga and exercises, but we're not hearing any of it. We're just like that. And we're not present in our body, mm -hmm. right? I had the 
fun years ago of talking with a whole bunch of yoga teachers at the Esalen Institute about refreshing our yoga by learning to re-inhabit it. Mm. And we do that through sensation. Uh, sensation is one of the components of mindfulness and it's, uh, we could say it's the intelligence of the body communicating, mm. sensation, breath, sensation. Then the heart, um, we're either kind of shut down and we know it, we're numbed out and we know it, or we might not know it, but we're, there's a distance from our emotions. But the other side of that is being emotionally touchy and thinking of ourselves as a person in our heart. When everything pushes our buttons, that's a good sign we're not in our heart. Mm. Our, the true quality of the heart is not that. Um, it's, a, it's a signal, it's the heart's way of saying, come back to me, come back to me. Right? When everything is, you know, somebody smiles at me and made my day and somebody doesn't smile at me and I'm angry or frustrated or crushed or running little stories in my head. And then similarly with the mind, um, when we're not present in the head center of the mind, we're either kind of dull, I call it a surly teenager mind. I don't know, I don't care, <laughs> I don't know, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes we put a little spiritual uh, glow on that. I'm a bhakti, I don't need to know anything, right? <laughs> it's just a kind of, I've abandoned that part of me and I'm proud of it. Um, <laughs> the other side of that is, where just our mind is chattering. We're not really thinking, and in both cases, we're not in our head. The true nature of mind is what we're looking for in mindfulness. Mm -hmm. The true nature of mind is crisp, clear, attentive, focused, quiet. And that, that's how we know we're coming into the head center. When, we're, when we start to feel more a kind of non-locatable kindness mm -hmm. and a gentleness and a patience, then we know we're coming into the domain of the heart. And when we start to actually feel our butt in the chair, I'm actually here in this room with these people, mm -hmm. right? Then yeah. we start to know our bodies online. And the idea is, in the Enneagram is, you don't wanna play favorites with the centers. Is that there's no advantage in being a third of a human being. So we're, we're learning to bring them together and align them. And mindfulness or presence is the medium that can bring these very different intelligences in a human being into alignment. Mm. That's really, for me, what the core of the Enneagram is about. Now, you had a shirt on that said, identity is an illusion, which I found <laughs> very fascinating for an Enneagram teacher, yeah. where a lot of people take the Enneagram to just type you. Yeah. So is this due to your background in studying meditation, or what's your blend? <laughs> well, I think that... Yeah, you know, I, I got my degree at uh, Columbia U in, in Buddhist studies, actually. So uh, I was very well trained in the perspective of, of Buddhism, classical Buddhism. But I also think that um, we have an identity, but it's not fixed. You can't draw a picture of your identity. You know, you can draw symbols of it, if you like, but they'll just be a symbol of an aspect of it. Identity for me is mystery. Um, we talk about it in relation to point four on the Enneagram, but point four is a type, but it's also the search for our true identity. Mm -hmm. And um, we discover it through the realization of beauty, of intimacy. You know, in a moment of intimacy, like, you know, we're here and the mm -hmm. ideas of who we are, what we are, what's going on here kind of fall away and we're informed by a bigger mystery. Mm. And to me, those are the signposts we're coming closer to identity. So as soon as I kind of think I know who I am, I'm, I'm probably lost in the woods. Mm. I think it was yeah. Adya Shanti said, looking for yourself and not finding yourself is finding yourself. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's very type four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you started going a little into the types. Do you want to just do a brief overview so people can oh, understand? Sure. I, I think that, because uh, there's a lot of you who are new to it, uh, 
Well, I like to start with eight, and people say, why don't you start with one? Um, the reason we start with eight is the eight, nine, and one, all three of them have to do with embodiment and the challenges to embodiment and whether we're going to be in that kind of resistance or, or activity or whether we're going to inhabit our body. So they're about the opportunities and challenges of that. So eight is about our fundamental aliveness, that when people are present, they're more alive, they're more vital, they're more real, they're more immediate in their expression. And if we are that person, we're experiencing things more directly, more unmediated. Mm -hmm. There are less filters. We're just right here in our experience, and there's power in that. So eight is about power, and it's about being in our body with enough life force and strength that we can bear to have our heart open. Mm -hmm. It's being strong enough to love. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we look at that, and then we look at the, the character structure of what do human beings do when they lose that? So we either toughen ourselves up, if we're an eight, we don't let things get to us, we harden ourselves, or we just say, well, I'm dead, and that's okay with me. Mm -hmm. Something fell down. <laughs> uh, the nine is, uh, sits at the top of the Enneagram, and so it's very fundamental. Uh, nine is about that great question from Hamlet, to be or not to be? And it's the study of how much of life we're not being how much we're not here, how much we're on autopilot, even when we're doing very skillful things, even when we're running meetings and so forth, mm -hmm. we're not really here embodied and in our experience. So nine is about our capacity to land, to come home to our, the only moment we have, this living reality that we're part of. And when we come home into our body, we feel more connected with the living universe. And there's a sense of harmony that's restored. And that's the journey of the nine. When we're not that, and this is a, a very popular for people who are not nines in the spiritual world, we create trances that take us out of the moment. And we become identified with internal states or trances. And then we get annoyed that the world is messing with our presence. The world is presence, my friends. It can't mess with presence. <laughs> Right, but we can get kind of into that namaste state where we're not really here. So there, there's a sense, it, and this is all fine work. This is not something anybody showed me when I started off, but to discriminate the difference between being truly landed, being really here with you, and being in my happy inner world that I've basically shut out being affected by the world. Yeah, enlightenment is not schizoid detachment. Mm. So... Um, the one is about when we're present, we, the sense of the goodness of the world is restored. Uh, there's, there's, we feel the sacredness of the moment, and it doesn't matter if there's something good happening or not. Uh, I'm going through a family tragedy right now, and uh, I've been at the side of many people dying, and and I would imagine some of you have too. And when you're with someone, even in that moment, if you're there, present, there's something namelessly sacred about that moment, the dignity of that person's journey and yours. You remember something. I was in New York on September 11th, and for days, this quality of just something holding our city was just palpable. And it's like we were remembering something for a little while there. So that sense of uh, the sacredness, the goodness of reality also makes us want to mature, wants to make us align with what's good and real in us. So the journey of the one is res the restoration of that sense of goodness and sacredness and what really matters to us as human beings. And oddly, you find that through the body. I know, That's I why that, when that. you learn meditation, <laughs> what's the first thing they focus on, right? Your posture, are you, do you have your asana right, right? Are you, are you sitting, are you in your body in a way that the energies can flow and move in you? All of these things have been known throughout history. This is just another way of looking at it and seeing what may have dropped off of our attention, right? Mm. So the two, now we're switching around to the heart center, the two, three, and four about the heart. The two is that part of our heart that goes out to people. 
that just goes out to others, sees a cute animal or even a tree. I know twos that love their car, <laughs> right? Oh, honey, you're doing so good, right? <laughs> but <laughs> there's, there's that sense of the way our heart is naturally generous, naturally seeks connection. We want to know each other on a heart level. We want to feel heart to heart. And uh, when we find that and it's real, life has a, a sweetness, a lightness to it. There's no suffering in real heart connection in the same way. It holds our suffering, actually. It's the part of us that can hold the difficulty of myself or another. That's pretty important. But that comes from presence in the heart, right? When we're not present in this part, we either are not connected and we don't care, or the people who identify as twos, they're tr constantly trying to make connection happen, but they're which is a good thing, but it's coming from the wrong part of me. So that even if that person responded to me, I still won't feel the connection because I'm not landed in the part of my heart that would recognize it. So I'm... I'm looking for love in all the wrong places. It's a pretty popular pastime, isn't it? You don't have to be a two. Um, yeah, it's coming home to your heart. So the three um, is a big kind of um, archetype for uh, many cultures in the world. Traditionally, it's been here in U.S. culture, but I'd say I, I teach in, in Asia a lot, and it's really big in China now, threeness, right? But threeness is about um, meaning and purpose and the sense that of, of feeling the, the value of your existence and what you're doing. And how when we're doing things from heart, from presence, everything we do feels meaningful and blessed and beautiful. You could be chopping carrots, you could be leading a meeting, you could be cleaning up after your dog and it all feels like sacred work, right? Um, I talk about this sometimes in organizations because people hear the word heart and in organizations they think suddenly we're gonna have encounter sessions or something and that people are just gonna be emoting. But I always remind people that the heart is where the sense of meaning comes from. So if you have an organization that doesn't allow space for heart, you can't expect a lot of motivation or inspiration or any sense of meaning in the work that people are doing. Mm. So when we don't have that beautiful golden feeling of the wonder of our existence, of our life, of loving who we are and that we have been given capacities, another way to look at it is, you know, there's like different enlightenments. The, the nine enlightenment is recognizing that your presence and being, your consciousness. The three enlightenment is, yeah, and I'm also this person who has these particular capacities, who's here in this world for some purpose. Like that consciousness took the trouble to create this vehicle, and the vehicle counts. It's sort of the, um, it's sort of the insurance policy against subconscious spiritual self-rejection. Right? So you understand you're here to fulfill something. Like when you feel this feeling in your heart, it's like you're remembering a promise that you forgot you made. And so the, from here, we do beautiful things. We, we, we do beautiful work, whatever it is that we're called to do. And the loss of it is the symptom that we see everywhere where we're desperately running around trying to find meaning, find purpose, feel important enough, feel valuable enough. How much money do I have to make? Where do I need to work? How cute do I need to be? How much plastic surgery do I need? What, et cetera, to make me feel valuable again. It's that big hole in our heart, mm -hmm. that emptiness that we're so desperately trying to fill. Um, it's a, you know, all these things, if you understand them rightly, you cannot judge other people so easily. You, you feel the sorrow and the suffering that's generating their behaviors. Right, so we come to four, and four is um, we talked a little bit is this search for identity and living a life of mystery and beauty and exquisite intimacy, and making sure that there's space for that in my life, right? Mm. Showing up in a way that invites the sense of beauty and intimacy, and when we are not so present, we're desperately trying to find our identity. And with the four, there's this 
weird fantasy that other people have found it and I haven't. <laughs> they all got it together and what happened to me, I didn't get handed something on the way in. So as people are listening, it's yeah. interesting, just even as you were talking, yeah. I noticed myself when you were doing the body types, I found myself wanting to sit and be uh. a little bit more in my seat. And then also, as you're now talking about the heart, you're lighting up different ways to just be in your heart and use your heart as a gift for yes. presence. Yes, one of what I'm forever uh, sort of advocating with the people who study with me is that teaching is being what you're talking about. Mm. If, if I'm talking about intimacy and I'm not intimate with you in that moment or intimate with you, it, what does that mean? Um, it makes it tricky sometimes because you can fall into these places and suddenly you're like looking out there and going, where was I? <laughs> but that's kind of fun too and you just share that. It's an intimate moment, right? Um, yeah, when we're, we're in search of identity though, you can feel the suffering of that and this feeling like when we can't find the identity, we tend to think there's something wrong with us, that we're defective somehow, that we are missing something other people have. Um, and we're constantly going over our narratives endlessly, reweaving our story, sorting through it over and over again, like this time I'm gonna figure it out and know who I am. And you know, I'm not one who will say that all narratives are false and I think it's very obnoxious to tell somebody else, you're in your story, I'm in my story about you when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> People use these, <laughs> these teachings for, you know, egoics, you know, jujitsu or some, self-defense. But... Um, spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Yeah. I, I, you know the one I, my, I'm famous for, right? Namaste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, so the four is, is when we're looking, again, in the wrong place to find this identity. But when we, we can only find it through presence. So the, the last three is the five, six, and seven. We could skip the five, that's okay, I don't need to talk about them. He's a five. <laughs> uh, the five, six, seven are about the head center. First off, the head center doesn't work right unless it's plugged into the body and the heart. You can't really have your mind work without embodiment and without heart connection. It's the quality of contact that brings knowing or genuine understanding, right? We might memorize a lot of things, but that doesn't mean we know anything, right? So knowing in the sense of wisdom. So the five is about our desire to understand and to come to some real understanding of what this world is. Um, five is about a quality, when we're more present, we're more clear. Our thinking is clearer, our perception is clearer, our communication, is clearer, we're even kind of easier to see, right? And when we don't have that, we're kind of blurry and we might be speaking in English sentences or whatever language we speak and people are going, huh, what? Yeah, they, they can't quite follow it because we don't have clarity. Mm. Um, clarity is also lets us see through things and it helps us see through the million and one things we've believed that ain't so. Clarity is that sword in Buddhism that cuts through, this Manjushri, right? This cuts through the delusions, helps us see all the ways we've ensnared our mind and stuff that isn't the living reality. So it's that penetrating quality of clarity that we need beginning, middle, and end. Try to get enlightened without that, right? Whatever that means. So then... Um, when we lose that, we're trying to figure everything out, but on the wrong basis. Without that contact and connection and heart, we memorize stuff. And a lot of our education is about what? Memorizing stuff. And we can memorize a lot of stuff, but it doesn't mean we know how to use what we've memorized. The real knowing is that kind of aha quality. Like, oh, oh, now I get it, wow. It could be about a relationship. It's not necessarily about something philosophical or scientific. So the six is, um, is the, uh, another one of the main triangle, nine, three, and six. So if three was about realizing 
Yes, I'm consciousness and I'm this person. Six is, oh, and so are you, and so what are we? What is this? What is humanity's objective function in a living cosmos? I personally feel that the lesson of point six is going to make or break our civilization within the next century. We're either gonna figure out how we consciously work together for some greater good, or we're gonna go through a very rough period. So the six is about that, well, it, the quality here of the head center is awakeness. We're talking about waking up. Well, what do we wake up to? This quality of awakeness. A, a lucid, awake, attentive quality. This is mindfulness itself. It's paying attention, but from a relaxed <coughs> body and heart. It's not a tense, I'm going to be mindful now. It's like, hi. Right? It's, it's a, we relax into this quality of attention. And with this real awakeness, mindfulness, and, the, and many of the speakers have talked about this, heart comes forward as the sense of service and devotion. When the awakeness is real, it comes with this sense of devotion. Like even if you're just doing some little thing, you're doing it with love. You're, you're bringing your attention to it. You're bringing a love and devotion to what you're doing. You're having a conversation. You're bringing your attention to that conversation and you're bringing a love and sense of service to it. So that's like the high side of six. And so that's a journey. We all need to find that, right? And if you lost in that, the other part of that awakeness is it has what I call our internal GPS system. It's guidance about what to do, how to make decisions. Where are we going next? Um, what, should I turn left or turn right? Should I say that to my daughter? Should I keep my mouth shut? And, and so this, there's a place when we relax and the head center opens up, without any effort, we know what to do in the moment. You rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. You think of all kinds of things you're gonna say and how you're gonna put it across. And then you're in that moment and you let go of all of it and the right words come out of your mouth. That's this. You know that, I thought I was going over there, but for some reason I feel I need to go over here. We call it guidance guidance system. So that's six. When we lose presence here, we lose our guidance system. And the, the natural response to this is, oh my God, what's going to happen next? <laughs> and we're bracing ourselves and there's the physical part and we're anxious and there's the emotional part and our mind is just spinning, spinning, spinning. What should I do? Did I cover that? I need to, I got to handle that. The kids pick up the kids at four. Yes, I'll get to do that. Blah, 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 blah. And, and that's a lot of life. Mm. And so we're kind of in this interbulated, instead of living, we're handling life. And that's the kind of what six, when if we're in six, we're gonna encounter that and that's what can get transmuted back to the other thing. They're all workable. And then the last one is the seven. Finally. Yeah, I know, I gotta <laughs> save the best for last, right? <laughs> so, yeah, seven is our inner freedom. When we're present in our mind, our mind is spacious, open to infinite possibility. There's no walls or boundaries around it. And there's this vast inner freedom that many teachers and teachings talk about. And that inner freedom um, also is the experience of delight. There's a, uh, I call it causeless positivity where I'm not happy because I got what I wanted and I'm not unhappy because I didn't get what I wanted there's a kind of positivity that never leaves me. As I said, I'm, I lost a, a nephew a few days ago, and I'm grieving, and I feel sad about that. I feel sad for my family, and at the same time, there is this lightness around my heart and being that's holding me through this and never leaves. And any time I'm present enough to notice, there it is. And it's opening and say there's end possibility, step forward, be bold, check it out. It's, it's also just really simply being open-minded, right, on a very pedestrian level. So, so when you have that going for you, well, life is a lot more enjoyable, to say the least. But the loss of that, some people say, well, you know, I live in a cramped dungeon of consciousness and that's how it is. But the sevens, no. 
I'm going to create freedom for myself. I'm going to go out and find joy. But when we're detached from that fundamental ground, all these things end up being frustrating and disappointing and never quite it. So it leaves us restless and hungry and endlessly looking for these things. So that's the nine points in brief. Wonderful. And right in time. We're actually out of time. But that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much for helping us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.